that for more Microsoft webcasts, you can go to Microsoft.com forward slash webcast. Thanks again for joining us on today's TechNet webcast, SQL Server 2008, Fast Track, and Parallel Data Warehouse. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's presenter, David Rodriguez. David, you have the floor. Thank you, Phil. Um, as uh, Phil said, we're going to be covering the Fast Track and Parallel Data Warehouse topic. Uh, this is uh, a very uh, full session, so I'm going to try to go through as much content as possible. Uh, there will be some time at the end for questions and answers as well. So without further ado, we will move on. The agenda for this session uh, starts off with traditional data warehousing, a discussion of the Microsoft vision for warehousing. Um, our offerings in this space, both the fast track and um, the parallel data warehouse. In the fast track, we'll go into a little bit of depth in terms of uh, what the architecture is, uh, target workloads, and even uh, documentation on what we're uh, recommending in terms of optimization for storage, loading, and maintenance. Uh, then we'll do a parallel data warehouse discussion to go over all the different components of the Microsoft SQL Server R 2008 R2 Parallel Data Warehouse. The uh, pair, uh, pains of data warehousing uh, that we've experienced and, and you as customers have uh, seen is, you know, where do you start with the process? Uh, how should the system be configured? Is it a standard relational database, but just with different schema? Um, what are the different um, batching and uh, loading processes? Uh, most data warehouses uh, start growing exponentially, and so you start running out of space. How do you add space to these larger uh, implementations? And then you have the inevitable issues of concurrency and query performance, uh, which, uh, which inevitably spawn from these types of systems, especially when they're grown uh, organically. And finally, there's another pain of the uh, data warehousing uh, workload, and that's the need for consistency. A lot of times you'll have query performance that's good for one query, and then two seconds later another query is run with uh, the similar attributes but significantly uh, different performance characteristics. So the goals for us from the Microsoft perspective are to help really alleviate all of these pain points uh, with our offering in the, in the Microsoft uh, stack. Therefore, we've introduced something called the SQL Server Fast Track uh, Data Warehousing uh, Model. Uh, it focuses on a workload type for data warehousing versus the OLTP workload type. So I'm just going to kind of go over a little bit of a definition difference between the two types as we see them. Obviously, OLTP, or Online Transaction Processing Systems, generally have a balanced uh, read-update ratio of about 60% uh, read to about 40% update. They're very fine-grained inserts and updates. Uh, you know, if you think about any... Uh, ERP system, there's an update of a single record for a customer, there's an update for a transaction for a, uh, an item sold. So there's a high transaction throughput um, that are uni unitary uh, transactions run against uh, individual rows. They're usually very short transactions as well and don't uh, encompass many, many tables uh, to do one update. Uh, and then sometimes there are multiple uh, step uh, transactions such as financial transactions for closing books and, and the like. So there is some workload that is uh, kind of spanning multiple databases and multiple tables, uh, but in general, it's very unary uh, operations. And they're relatively small data sizes uh, in the few terabytes uh, level, not the, the massive sizes that we've been experiencing with data warehousing workloads. So in contrast, the data warehousing and business in, uh, analysis uh, workspace is generally a read mostly model, 90% or even more of the transactions that are applied against the data warehouse are read transactions, so they're pulling data from these larger sets. There are a few updates in place. Usually there are bulk inserts across the board, so it's not single unit updates. They're spread across uh, thousands and thousands of records, uh, but they're usually bulk loaded. Concurrency uh, for query throughput is usually in the tens of thousands of uh, per hour. Uh, per query response times are usually less than two seconds. And uh, there's generally a different schema for a data warehousing workload than there is an OLTP workload. These are usually what we call snowflake or star schema. Uh, and they allow you to have a few tables with uh, very lar some very large tables and then reference tables uh, attached in some way. Uh, generally, the data warehousing workload and business analysis uh, workload requires complex queries, uh, which will do a lot of filtering, joining, grouping by, and aggregation. And these generally uh, occur against very large uh, data sizes on the tens of terabytes to the petabyte uh, level. So the way we look at it is for OLTP, that's the day-to-day -day business, and for uh, data warehousing, that's really analysis over very large data sets. 
In terms of data warehousing uh, workload characteristics, here's kind of an example. Uh, it's a very scan-intensive uh, query. Uh, hash joins and aggregations are often uh, utilized for this workload. Uh, you can see the select statement is, uh, is actually uh, doing a group by, an order by, and uh, pulling a lot of data sets from this uh, line item table. So uh, some of the uh, SQL Server data warehouses today uh, that you can see, generally this is kind of the, the view that, that you often have. You have a big SAN, uh, a big SMP server, so uh, symmetric multiprocessor server with between four and eight sockets that could have between four and six uh, cores, and these two systems are generally connected together. However, as you grow, you have certain issues. So what's wrong with this picture as you're throwing in more and more disk subsystems and more and more servers? Uh, the answer is that the system becomes out of balance. The addition of more workload to that same SAN uh, actually impacts all of the data warehousing workload that has been uh, traditionally uh, performed on that server. So the server can consume about 16 gigabytes per second of I.O., but the SAN at this uh, juncture can only deliver about 2 gigabytes per second. So even when the SAN is dedicated to a SQL warehouse, uh, which it often isn't, uh, lots of uh, I.O. is really being uh, the bottleneck for the system. So lots of disk and random I.O. Uh, are available, but uh, because of the um, limited controllers that are on these SANs, uh, the throughput, which is really what you care about in a data warehousing workload with these very large data sets, uh, is limited significantly. So uh, systems that are generally data warehousing systems are typically I.O. bound. So it doesn't matter how many CPUs you throw at it or how much uh, RAM you throw at it, uh, you're not going to be able to significantly impact your workload. Uh, and, and what we often find is people try to do that and then they uh, are disappointed by the fact that they've spent uh, thousands and thousands of dollars on one component and not solved the problem. Uh, therefore, there's a significant investment uh, but it's not delivering on the performance uh, requirements. And, and obviously that's an important aspect when you're talking about these uh, data warehousing workloads. So let's talk about the different performance bottlenecks uh, that you can have in a system of, of uh, SQL Server data warehouse. First of all, on the server, there's a CPU feed rate. Uh, this is really the determining factor as to how much I.O., uh, how much memory um, data points can flow through a certain CPU. And uh, the goal is, obviously, when you're doing a query, uh, to be able to, to flush through that CPU as much data as possible in order for it to do the joins, the queries, uh, the, the filtering. Uh, then there's a SQL Server read-ahead scan rate, which allows you to pull data at larger blocks uh, than, what C, than what the CPU uh, is requesting. So if the CPU, uh, certain queries requesting a certain amount of uh, records, then the C, SQL Server will scan ahead and expecting that you'll probably be pulling the next a uh, few uh, pages of records, uh, try to get them in cache and available for the CPU. Then there's another bottleneck, which is the HBA, uh, the host uh, bus interface. Um, and that, what that tool is, is it's an interface between your central processing units and your storage arrays. And generally, these HBAs have specific uh, rates that they're able to deliver uh, bandwidth through. And the, they are the I.O. port, and, and oftentimes, um, if you have too few of them or if they're not sufficiently sized, uh, they can become a bottleneck. And then there's usually a uh, fiber channel switch. Obviously, these HBAs are generally fiber channel connecting to some storage array, uh, generally a, a SAN. And uh, those storage arrays are connected through what we call a fiber channel switch. That, again, can be a significant bottleneck, especially if you have, just, just in terms of thinking about um, networking, if you have 10,000 users connected to one switch, that's going to definitely have a, a lot lower throughput than if you have five users connected to the same switch. Same concept goes with a storage array. If I have a fiber channel switch that um, provides certain bandwidth, uh, but that bandwidth is lower than the theoretical and the actual uh, bandwidth throughput of the fiber channel controllers and the storage array, then the fiber channel switch becomes the bottleneck. Uh, and continuing down the storage controller itself, every SAN has uh, a certain number of storage controllers and there is a theoretical and an actual throughput rate of how much data can flow through a given storage controller into the fiber channel switch. Uh, those storage controllers have caches as well, but when you're talking about a data workload uh, that is data warehousing, the cache can be helpful, but is not necessarily uh, that helpful because you're usually doing scans across 
large sets of data, and you generally will flush the cache with every single query and therefore not get much value out of, out of caching um, on the SAN infrastructure. Uh, caching is very useful for the SAN infrastructure for the OLTP model. Um, and then finally, there is the physical disks, the, the LUN read rate uh, for every disk and the disk feed rate. So how quickly can those disks actually uh, service the requests uh, going to the storage controllers in the SAN? Every single one of these points is a potential performance bottleneck for a database infrastructure. And our goal is to be able to identify and alleviate all of these in terms of uh, balancing of the architecture. So the alternative to what we talked about a few minutes ago, which was a, a centralized server um, with a SAN attached to it and possibly multiple servers connecting to the same SAN, is to define a, a server and storage configuration that will deliver a balanced I.O. bandwidth that is defined by the CPU consumption rate. So it's really taking it and saying, what is the performance that I can get out of a given CPU, and making sure that every component uh, before that CPU is balanced in order to deliver at that theoretical through point. And therefore, in general, you'll have a much um, more predictable delivery of your query results. This also um, is it's very important to think through that you want to avoid sharing of storage devices among servers for this type of model. Uh, obviously, I cannot control the, uh, the storage characteristics if my same SAN is utilized by three or four other systems, such as OLTP systems and the like. Uh, those same SANs then uh, do not have any kind of predictable nature uh, based on those other systems uh, utilizing the SAN in a, in a bursty or sporadic basis. You also want to uh, avoid over-investing in disk drives. Uh, generally, uh, when you look at the SAN architectures, the SANs uh, focus on IOPS, and what we're really looking at is scan performance. So how do I pull in as much data in almost a synchronous way as possible? So layout and management as well of the, of the disk uh, array and the layout of the, of the files on the disk array and every different component is very important in terms of this balanced system architecture. And this is where Microsoft Fast Track helps you to, to resolve that. So let's kind of look at a comparison between Fast Track versus traditional data warehouse architecture. First of all, in traditional data warehouse architecture, this is, you know, what we often find with many customers using SQL Server. They'll have a four processor, 16 or 24 core server. Um, with SQL Server 2008 um, installed on that server in a symmetric multiprocessing model, and they will have shared network bandwidth to their SAN. And so, in other words, they have a fiber channel connection to that SAN that is shared with other um, fiber channel ports to that same SAN. There's also a lot of other applications that are leveraging that same enterprise shared SAN. Now, there often becomes a bottleneck then in terms of the storage processors on those SANs because there are a limited number of storage processors and those may uh, cause a bottleneck for this infrastructure. So the alternative is a fast-track data warehouse architecture with a dedicated data warehouse infrastructure um, modeled after our data warehouse appliances. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as we go through it. Um, four terabytes, 32 terabyte pre-tested workload configurations are already configured and even um, built out by uh, our vendors, our partner vendors. So it's very easy to acquire one of these in a much uh, richer and easier way. So the, the architecture includes dedicated, very low-cost SAN arrays, uh, about one for every four CPU cores. Now, this is a, a changing number as CPU cores improve in performance, as there are more cores per socket. Um, this number uh, will change over time. But at this point, um, the architecture is de designed for about one uh, mini SAN, would be the way I would describe it, per uh, for CPU cores. Now, the important thing to, to note here is this is not the SAN that most uh, organizations consider their enterprise shared storage array network. Uh, those SANs are very, very expensive, um, very highly tuned for a lot of different options, for uh, adding um, disk drives. There's, there's just a lot of expense that's put into them. So what, these are, uh, what we're talking about here are more of a commoditized version of a disk cage that has the word SAN attached to it. Now, you have also uh, an architecture that includes the dedicated network bandwidth. This is a dedicated fiber channel bandwidth between your SQL Server and these dedicated low-cost SANs. Now, uh, suspend disbelief for a few seconds because obviously when people talk about SANs and the cost of SANs and, and this architecture right here we're talking about with a 16-core infrastructure is showing four dedicated SANs, 
uh, can, can definitely look like it can be expensive, but we'll talk through the architecture and then uh, the actual cost structure, which is, is phenomenally low. So the benefits uh, of this architecture is, first of all, it's a pre-tested configuration that lowers your total cost of ownership. It's balanced CPU and I.O. channel optimizations specifically for the data work warehousing workload. Uh, we've done a lot of research in that to identify what that workload would be. It's modular, so we can, in essence, build this out to be larger and larger systems simply using the same approach. And frankly, this similar approach is what we've used for our parallel data warehouse infrastructure. And then you can scale this out or up within the limits of the server and SAN configurations. So it's a, it's a very useful model for, uh, for scaling uh, your business workload. So let's talk a little bit about what SQL Server Fast Track uh, Data Warehouse, what it really is. Uh, this is a solution to help customers and partners accelerate their data warehouse deployments. It's a method for designing a cost-effective balanced system for data warehousing workloads and a reference hardware configuration uh, that is developed in conjunction with our hardware partners specific to the, uh, showing the benefits of what their solutions can provide. Uh, the other benefit here is obviously it allows uh, customers to have the freedom of choice uh, versus uh, what hardware vendor they would like because the, the big vendors are um, already pre-configured for these configurations. And on top of that, it is a set of best practices for laying out the data and loading and managing the data for your data warehouse. So it's a method, it's configurations, and best practices. It is all built into a documentation set that we provide freely. It's available on the web. Um, and it's also a, uh, a set of bill of materials that each one of our hardware vendors can, can deliver uh, with just a, a request for, I need this specific configuration. So it takes a lot of the guesswork out of tuning a system to our customers uh, and puts it into the hands of Microsoft and our hardware vendors. And again, it's the very low cost approach. Now one note here is the Fast Track Data Warehouse is specifically a relational data warehouse. We're not talking about integration services or uh, reporting services or analysis services. It's specifically a data warehousing specific component. So if we look at the scope of what a Fast Track would look like, you can see that everything in the bottom left dotted box is really the reference architecture for the data warehouse. It's your server and dedicated SAN and storage array connected to that server. That server would then be hosting the data tables that are utilized by analysis services cubes. Uh, it would be filled and loaded through supporting systems such as your ETL tools, such as integration services. And then there'd be a presentation layer on top of it, which could do direct queries to your data warehouse tables, um, or it could connect to cubes or have some kind of uh, intermediary BI tools. So it's really just a relational engine for your data warehouse. Some of the benefits of the fast track data warehouse that I've alluded to already is, first of all, lower TCO. It minimizes the risk of overspending on unbalanced hardware configurations. This is probably one of the most significant uh, areas of pain for our customers uh, in that they are trying to build a data warehouse and then performance is not uh, at the level that they're looking for and they're trying to identify specific bottlenecks. This is a way to remove all bottlenecks from the beginning for your data warehouse workload and make sure that the system is completely tuned uh, to meet your needs up front. It is utilizing standard uh, industry standard hardware as well, which is a significant benefit because we're riding on top of Moore's Law, taking advantage of the every 18 months doubling of uh, hardware performance. Therefore, for total cost of ownership, each time you acquire a fast track system, you're getting the most performance system for the lowest cost, uh, leveraging commodity hardware pricing. And I can't stress that enough compared to some of the other uh, data warehousing technologies in the marketplace. Choice of hardware platform is another uh, benefit that this uh, architecture allows you. You can see on the right we have 12 uh, symmetric multiprocessing reference architectures for this from HP, Dell, Bull, IBM, and EMC. And those are our har hardware partners, but there are obviously um, other solutions we can talk about in the Q&A. Um, it, it allows the implementation by the vendor, therefore the vendor makes sure that their system is completely tuned and can deliver it to you in a very rapid format uh, as a single unit of purchase. It also reduces the risk because this infrastructure is validated by Microsoft at our Microsoft Labs with SQL Server uh, and our product team. It encapsulates all of our best practices, so uh, simply by running the scripts, utilizing the technology, taking advantage of the hardware, uh, you're uh, being able to stand on top of the shoulders of, of those uh, people who have made uh, a lot of an analytic uh, attempts at figuring out the best way to deliver on a data warehousing platform. Uh, and then obviously you get a known performance and scalability uh, characteristics 
This is that ability to be predictive in terms of your SQL Server uh, warehouse experience. So how can I tell if a fast track is right for me? Well, uh, workload evaluation is the most important thing. Uh, understanding what your workload is that you're going to uh, apply to your data warehousing infrastructure. Uh, the fast track re reference documentation uh, and training provides uh, a basic uh, framework for evaluating these <clears throat> opportunities. And it's very important for you to identify uh, the appropriate workloads um, because fast track is, is completely tuned for a data warehousing workload based on what we talked about earlier in this, in this talk. Um, the fast track it tra traditionally uh, targets traditional data warehousing scenarios, uh, such as large scan rates, large fact tables, um, writes for history, um, minimal change over time. So if you're having, uh, let's say, a data warehouse that 80% um, of the data warehouse is actually having singleton updates applied to that data warehouse on a daily basis, then fast track is not the right approach. If you're having a large data warehouse that on a daily or a monthly or a weekly or even hourly basis, you're updating records of the most recent transactions since the last time you did a batch update, uh, this is going to be an ideal scenario for you. <clears throat> so there's balanced architecture components um, that we'll talk through uh, of what the fast track is all about. Uh, there is a, a whole philosophy uh, around the architecture of how you build a fast track uh, implementation. And again, this is all built in to um, what we've delivered with our partners. So Fast Track focuses on balancing the major hardware components, each one of those that I described earlier, the HBAs, the, the, the storage arrays, uh, all the different components. And of course, major is defined as the components relevant to the overall I.O. throughput and data processing capability of the system. The balance for the Fast Track is defined in relation to SQL Server data processing capability, storage system I.O. capability, and the total hardware component cost. So we took all those into account as we architected the solution. Here is a component architecture layout. You can see at the right-hand side we have the disk array and the storage processors. Those are connected through uh, the storage enclosure uh, to a storage interconnect, and this is the fiber channel infrastructure. Then we have host storage adapters that are on the server, and those host storage adapters connect to uh, the CPU and provide I.O. throughput for the CPU. Components, as I said before, are the CPU. There's a maximum consumption rate that is how much data can flow through a given CPU, and that's, uh, we've been uh, looking at it in terms of a rule of thumb and also uh, actual analysis, and it's about 200 megabytes per second uh, can flow through that, that CPU. Uh, there's a controller. There's bandwidth needed to feed the CPU cores based on uh, the target query mix. So there's a service process controller. Um, there's also the HBAs itself. Uh, the host bus uh, connectors, and they have aggregate bandwidth um, to connect to their uh, controllers. There's a switch that connects the HBAs to the disks, and then there are the disks themselves. Each one of these components is what we're balancing for each one of these areas. Uh, there are a few evaluation metrics that we've put together in order to identify a system, in order to validate the system, and also in order to be able to allow customers and partners to create new systems that are similar to Fast Track. Uh, take advantage of the, of the learnings of Fast Track, but may have components that are unique to that customer need. So the metrics that we use uh, to validate uh, Fast Tracks with our partners and also to allow you to, to leverage them for yourself is what we call the maximum consumption rate, the benchmark consumption rate, and the user data capacity. I'll go in depth in each one of these over the next couple slides. So the maximum consumption rate uh, measures the rate at which SQL Server can process data from memory for a given CPU and server. Uh, this is measured per physical core, and it utilizes page compressed data. So when we look at the data, it's uh, leveraging a page compression model that I'll talk through more in a few seconds. It provides a, a starting point uh, uh, for the hardware selection. This, we like to allude to the miles per gallon on a sticker on a new car. Uh, mileage may vary, but this is generally the starting point as to what uh, the theoretical expectation could be. Um, for Fast Track 2.0, and that is the version of Fast Track that we're currently in, uh, this is the second release of the, of the configuration, uh, we've measured a mix of TPCH queries to reflect a prototype data warehouse workload. So this is a little bit different than what you will find in your specific workload, but it is standardized um, queries that would be for a traditional data warehousing. We concluded from that, as I said, around 200 megabytes per second per core 
on average based on the standard cores that are available, the x64 cores available. We use this as our basis for the published reference architecture, so all of our partners that are delivering the reference architectures utilize this as well. And as we uh, said, um, your mileage may vary. So for precise sizing, we recommend the next step, um, which is, sorry, I skipped a slide, uh, to leverage the benchmark consumption rate. The benchmark consumption rate measures the rate at which SQL Server can process data from disk for a given CPU and server for a unique customer workload. This is your specific query workload and your specific data. There uh, definitely will be some differences between this and the, uh, the theoretical uh, rate, but in general, the theoretical rate should get you very, very close. So um, this is an actual miles per gallon you get from your current driving habits. So it's a little bit different than the uh, sticker. Um, but standard values compared against the MCR um, in the fast track system um, are, are generally close to um, a BCR that is about 30% below the MCR rating for the system indicates a higher MCR uh, rated system should be chosen. So in other words, if you looked at your system and your your own benchmark consumption rate is significantly lower than what the um, expected consumption rate would be, then what you want to do is take a step up to the next system. And I'll talk through that. Uh, there are stratification or layers of the different systems available to you. So the benchmark is your specific, and uh, the, the next thing we talk about is the user data capacity. Um, this is the data capacity required, and each one of the systems that we describe has a, a theoretical or, or a an actual recommended approach. Um, obviously, there are uh, differences that you can apply to it, but user data capacity is really something that you should plan uh, for your projected growth uh, by identifying your system as to what you're expecting the growth to be and uh, build that user data capacity in at the beginning up front. Uh, there's a lot of benefits uh, to this, and also, um, again, since we're writing Moore's Law on this and taking advantage of the extreme benefits of the commoditization of hardware, uh, the cost of a few extra hard drives or having a different uh, hard drive configuration up front uh, is much less than uh, having any modification down the line. You want to allocate for data management needs as well, so staging database requirements, temporary objects, uh, stuff like that you want to add into your user data capacity. And you also want to allocate uh, for tempdb, typically around 20 to 30 percent of the primary data space. So you take your, your, expecta your expected primary data space and then add in um, about 20 to 30 percent for tempdb. So let's talk a little bit about maximum consumption rate, theoretical throughput for the for the I/O stack. Um, we looked at the the whole architecture and kind of created a, a building block component. So the building block for a fast track is a two socket quad core server, and that really would be eight total cores per server. Now that's just the building block, the starting point where we can kind of expand that and, ex and explain how that grows. But this is a layout of what that building block would look like. And you can see at the, the bottom right-hand uh, side, there's storage enclosures. And since we're talking about eight cores, there's about two storage enclosures to feed those eight cores to take advantage of, of the uh, balancing of the architecture. And you want to ensure that the I.O. is balanced across the entire infrastructure. And this will help you to, uh, to make sure that each different component is working at its, its optimal or at least close to its optimal utilization and uh, delivering on full performance. So if you look at the MCR of that server, it's about 1.6 gigabytes per second. Um, you take that down, so for every four socket, uh, uh, or four core socket, uh, you'll have an HBA allocated, and these are minimum of two gigabytes per second. You've got a fiber switch that's also got that two gigabytes per second. That can um, then fan out to four storage processors Generally, a storage enclosure, a SAN, has two storage processors each. So each one of these SANs is going to have about a 500 megabytes per second storage. And then the disk uh, layout inside of those, uh, as you can see, with 500 megabytes per uh, second for each one of these SANs, you have about 300 uh, megabytes per second per spindle. So the layout is really just kind of sized for that, and, and we go in, in much more in depth in terms of the, the documentation. So I don't have time to go too in depth on how it's documented, but uh, definitely I would recommend you look at the uh, at the specifications. So actual results from the uh, fast track validation, uh, I was just telling you the benchmark uh, or the let's back up. I was showing you the maximum consumption rate. So these are the numbers that every one of the vendors of each one of these pieces of hardware 
uh, say is their theoretical throughput, right? Now what we've done is we've analyzed that, run it in real physical hardware, and come to what we see as the benchmark consumption rate for most uh, implementations. And obviously this is where your actual mileage you get and actual mileage may vary based on your driving habits. Um, but you can see here that the storage enclosures actually have a little bit less megabytes per second throughput. The fiber switches have less um, throughput than you would expect, and storage enclosures have less than the theoretical. And so does the BCR, uh, which is the, the throughput that can be pushed through the actual cores. So every different component actually has a little bit of a, of a lower level for their benchmark consumption rate versus their theoretical. So how do we scale this architecture? Well, as I said before, it, we're doing it in building block components. So we have a, a four um, core socket. So I have two sockets of CPU. Well, an easy way to scale this is just look at this and say for every two CPU cores, uh, or every, for every four CPU cores, then I have one HBA. And for every one HBA, I have one um, storage enclosure. So I have two sockets. So I have two HBAs and I have two enclosures. So the next step is let's scale this up one. Let's put two more sockets in, therefore two more HBAs and two more storage enclosures. Let's go one step further, put in four more CPU sockets. So this is an eight socket server uh, with four cores each. So 32 cores. And then you can see that the HBAs are fully filled out and we have uh, a full eight storage enclosures in order to support uh, the, the total throughput of this system. Now, again, suspend disbelief in terms of what those storage enclosures are. I like the term storage enclosure in, in, instead of SAN because SAN has a lot of baggage, including the cost structure for SAN. These are really what I would call uh, more like high-end disk cages um, or disk arrays than it would be a SAN architecture. So optimizing the storage and, and loading and maintenance is an important aspect, too. So let's talk about how that's laid out. Um, first of all, the LUN configuration for these SANs, or storage enclosures, uh, is based on RAID 1 pairs. Uh, the op this is optimal for scan type access patterns, and again, looking at what the patterns are, scan uh, access is the most expected uh, for the, the workload. So we want to optimize for that. We also stripe across all the storage using SQL Server data files, and this is an important aspect as well. So we want to take advantage of every uh, capability, uh, parallel reads, and all the other capabilities that are built into SQL Server. So we want to have um, every data file, uh, uh, every data file group spanning all of the data, um, data files in the infrastructure. Uh, the observed throughput for a single RAID pair is about 130, 130 megabytes per second. And you can see that for every RAID group, we have two LUNs. That way we can get parallel reads out of this infrastructure very easily. So the storage layout implications for SQL Server is we want to create a SQL data file per LUN. So if we take a step back and look at that architecture, uh, we have eight LUNs that are available to us. So we're going to have eight files. So create a SQL data file per LUN. So eight LUNs, eight files for every file group. So for each file group that we have, we're going to actually have eight files. TempDB file groups would share the same LUNs as other databases, so it's, it would just be another um, file group that would be available on those LUNs spread across all of them. And then log is on a separate disk, so we, um, we use SQL striping on those log uh, files, and there's a lot of options that you can use for that. So here's a, a layout uh, implication for, for what this would be. So if I have a, a database called PermanentDB, you can see that I'm going to have PermanentDB NDF and we're going to uh, label them with a numbering scheme because it's very important to do that. Uh, you'd have permanent 1 on LUN 1, permanent 16 on LUN 16. You'd have a staging database. You'd have a temp database. And you can see each one of these uh, databases is going to have a file per LUN in their file group. Again, let's talk through why this is very important. Sequel, sequential I.O. Uh, for this data, uh, warehouse workload is very, very important. Uh, we want to scan large data sources, and we want to pull uh, all the data through the processing engine uh, and get predictable, scalable performance. By doing sequential I.O. versus random I.O., which is more of an OLTP workload, we actually require many fewer disk drives. 
And this is one of the differentiators between that standard architecture we were talking about earlier uh, with, a, with a large SAN um, that's shared amongst your data warehouse and your OLTP and all these other systems because we don't take advantage of, of the SAN the way that the OLTP systems and the file share systems and all these other systems do. We actually, with a sequential I.O. workload, uh, would require about a third or fewer drives to get the same I.O. consumption capabilities. Again, this is very important because what we're doing is we're doing kind of synchronous I.O. We're trying to do read-aheads and prefetching, get all that data into the SQL Server in a synchronous way. Therefore, we don't need as many I.O. spindles as you would expect for, let's say, an OLTP system to get very quick uh, unitary uh, writes. So uh, all database is important to note, uh, contain both scans and sync, seeks, uh, which would be sequential I.O. and random I.O. So it's very important that we don't com completely look at it from a sequential point of view. What we're doing is we're optimizing for sequential, but there still is the availability of, of random, randomized I.O. For the data warehouse workload, the vast majority are reads and they are sequential. So we, we have an expectation of um, taking advantage of this tuned system, but not all of them are. So sequential data layout is a key to the fast track performance. The total disk I.O. throughput assumes sequential scan rates, and, and scanning is, is an advantage and a positive thing in a fast track architecture. But that's not a bad assumption because in most data warehousing workloads, you're pulling in a lot of tables, uh, a lot of uh, rows from a given table, and then you're doing some kind of analytics aggregation on top of them. Um, so that's an important uh, distinction for this uh, workload. Uh, and as average request sizes shrink, the I.O. throughput drops dramatically, and fast uh, track configurations are not spindle rich. So you want to be very careful uh, as to the workload sizing in order to analyze how uh, the fast track system would be implemented. However, having said that, we have customers that have utilized the fast track system in a, uh, in a data warehousing workload that did not take into account sequential data layout for that workload and they're still achieving significant performance improvements. So here's kind of the layout of the sequential scan components. You can see at the top right, uh, 512K reads, but we have two megabyte prefetches, and we also have eight megabyte read aheads that occur uh, automatically on these systems. So the contiguous allocation and data striping give you a, a significant advantage uh, for these read aheads. So it's, it's important that we stripe the data um, in a balanced way uh, across the entire infrastructure so that we can take advantage of these read-aheads uh, very quickly and efficiently. Each element is necessary uh, to maximize this efficiency, obviously. So again, if we look at this build, what we're doing is we're saying we're doing this across every single one of those files that are spread across these spindle pairs. So it's important that every single spindle is, is taking a piece of the action, moving uh, a prefetch and a, a across the board as quickly as possible. So how do we create these sequential data layouts? There's a lot of documentation in the, in the specification, and we even have some scripts that we can provide you through that specification. Uh, but the goal is really to align logical and physical ordering of the data within a file group uh, and to load the data in a, a synchronous way so that you take advantage of uh, these prefetching capabilities. Two primary ways uh, FastTrack optimizes this allocation uh, is to minimize fragmentation and manage uh, load processing. Um, first of all, you want to minimize the fragmentation of the infrastructure. Therefore, you want to have as large of a load as, as possible. And when you do the loads, you want to make sure that the loads are actually uh, allowing for that uh, read-ahead and, and prefetch uh, capability to be pulling rows that you would care about. So in loading data, the primary method uh, used to create sequential data layout is to, uh, is to mi maximize sequential data layout and minimize fragmentation. And the way we do that is, uh, is focus on the architecture of the data load process. Concurrent load operations uh, occurred in the same file will introduce fragmentation. So we reduce the concurrency of single file load. But in order to get concurrency and parallelism, we will load in parallel many different files. So we get the advantages of the multiprocessors in our system, but what we do is we load any given file synchronously and, and do not have uh, as much fragmentation as you would expect. Um, we also try to reduce um, things like change operators, updates and deletes, because these obviously may uh, create uh, 
significant amounts of fragmentation. So to, to avoid fragmentation, uh, we focus on how do we load this infrastructure. So it's going to take a little bit of a different mindset, but frankly, uh, for the data warehousing workload, it's a very traditional and standard way to deal with it. Uh, other load re recommendations, um, they're, they're broken into two general scenarios. Uh, first of all, there's migration and then the incremental. A migration is when you're first loading your data warehouse from scratch or you're loading it from a previous data warehouse or something like that. They're very large, one-time, infrequent loads. Um, you typically are targeting temp, uh, empty tables and uh, less time sensitive to service level agreements in general because it's just part of a migration. Incremental loads, however, are the ones that happen continuously throughout the, uh, the week, month, day, year, whenever you're doing it. And these uh, typically target um, populated tables. So th there's a different way of architecting for that versus um, the migration workload. And we have documentation on how to, how to help with both of those. Fast track reference architectures that are available. Uh, I'm going through right here some of them that are available right now um, from HP, Dell, IBM, Bull. We have several partners that support this. Uh, you can see that each configuration underneath the server has the server name. It has the CPU type and the number of CPUs that are populated. And then also, in essence, the number of uh, effective cores that are available to you. Then we have the number of SANs that are allocated to those cores, uh, and then the data drive count that are allocated to those SANs. You can see that the initial capacity and maximum capacity numbers are also included. These are core balance capacities, so in essence, the recommended capacity. A way to look at this reference configuration is to say, I have a data warehousing project. I'm expecting it to be 12 terabytes within the next three years. So I will probably choose um, one of the systems such as the HP ProLiant DL585 G6 system. It has 12 terabytes starting capacity, uh, 24 terabytes maximum capacity. So if I'm expecting to be at 12 terabytes, maybe what I will do is um, build this out with a little bit larger capacity and uh, take advantage of growth over time, but have it uh, completely uh, expected to take all the workload uh, that I will be needing for the next uh, few years. That is going to provide you 24 CPUs. Uh, they are uh, leveraging six SANs. And again, the word SAN is kind of a misnomer here in certain respects because it's more of a uh, disk enclosure. And then that fast track architecture you can buy directly from our partner uh, to take advantage of that and not to be um, kind of focusing on a single um, partner. I'll also highlight the Dell PowerEdge R900 can provide the similar characteristics as well as the IBM X3850. M2, uh, and also the Bull Nova Scale. So in terms of those architectures, I'm going to go a little bit more in depth in each one of the areas just to highlight where, where we have this. Uh, there are also advantages uh, that we get from having a very large performance um, increase for Moore's Law. AMD and Intel have consistently been comparing uh, their results and leapfrogging each other in terms of the performance of their CPUs. Uh, and this has really driven Moore's Law. So the advantage that we're taking here is that there are AMD systems and there are Intel systems that each one of our partners can provide to you. The, the five AMD systems uh, and Intel-based systems from HP are highlighted here. I've got two slides, uh, one of which is the two-processor configuration. Uh, this is really the lowest configuration that we would recommend. And uh, I'm going to kind of walk through what that configuration looks like. First, uh, the, every one of the systems, as I said, kind of starts off with the two processor. These are two sockets and four cores at the minimum. So this would be, in essence, an, an eight-core minimum system. Uh, you can see that the HP ProLiant DL385 with a G6 configuration is actually a six-core AMD Operon. And the storage arrays, and again, these are what we're calling arrays. They are actual SANs, but they're very uh, low-cost alternatives, are the MSA storage uh, configuration. Scalability for this system is between 4 and 12 terabytes. We have many customers that they're right now having a 1 terabyte or 2 terabyte data warehouse, and they're being requested to scale that. A two-processor configuration for that architecture with this uh, very low-cost alternative uh, can definitely get them into the future and also uh, 
provide a, a much more a predictable query response for those same systems. For processor configuration, as you can see, it's the uh, same configuration, right? It's a 585 instead of a 385. It's got the six core AMDs, uh, and you can see we've actually added more storage because the storage actually directly is impacted by the number of CPUs. And then finally, there's an eight processor configuration. This is a fairly high-end system, frankly, provides uh, a lot of throughput. And you can see it's up to about 48 terabytes in terms of the storage. The other two of the HP offering are uh, the Intel-based offering, and you can see this is a four-core Xeon for the two-processor configuration and the six-core uh, Xeon for the four-processor configuration. And again, uh, maxes out at, four, at eight terabytes and 24 terabytes, respectively. Uh, there is no eight socket um, configuration at the moment for this. Now, in terms of IBM, uh, we have uh, the benefit for the customer is if you already have a, a hardware provider that provides these, then obviously they're, they're going to be able to sell you a configuration that's pre-tuned, pre-architectured. And to, they have a two-processor, a four-processor, an eight-processor configuration. This uses a DS340 storage system from IBM, and you can see that these are Intel-based uh, Xeon processors as well. And then uh, there is a alternative from Dell as well. And Dell provides the two and the four socket boxes. Uh, these uh, are with the Intel quad core for the two processor and six core for the four processor configuration. And again, eight terabytes and 24 terabytes respectively. And then finally, Bull it has provided a similar architecture with a two processor and a four processor configuration. Um, we find this leverages the EMC Clarion architecture for the SAN enclosures. And these are the, the lower cost, kind of like a mid-range SAN enclosure versus the, the high-end SANs that you would expect somewhere else. Uh, also included in the Bull architecture is uh, their analysis services, reporting services, integration services built in. So sample fast track uh, warehouse pricing, uh, the first note that I would like to highlight and highlight again and possibly again is this is not actual pricing, but ballpark pricing for demonstration purposes only. Uh, in terms of mileage may vary, it definitely will vary. Uh, these are numbers that are um, that we're not liable for. <laughs> so uh, please definitely talk to your vendor of choice. But I did want to give you kind of a, a, a feel for what these systems generally will cost, including all of the hardware. So if you look at the Dell system, this is the four to eight terabyte two socket, and every one of these configs is a two socket config. So between 6 and 12 terabytes, um, you're going to look at a PowerEdge R710. Uh, it's about 16,000. And as I said before, the prices you know, may vary based on your, your own purchasing agreements. But in the ballpark of about uh, between 16 and $20,000 for the system, uh, fiber channel about 10,000 or less, uh, the switches uh, a couple thousand bucks or less, uh, the cables a thousand or so dollars, and then the SAN arrays, remember, these are very low-cost SAN. So you're buying or purchasing two full SAN cages uh, fully populated with the hard drives for about $50,000. That's a very different monetary scheme than you would expect when you're talking to your SAN guys. So when you play this demo for them or you talk to them, uh, definitely walk them through the fact that this is not the SAN that they traditionally purchase. Uh, in, in terms of the HP, you can see it's around the same price points for all the different components. And then similar with the IBM, IBM having uh, a SAN array um, price point that's actually significantly lower uh, than what we've seen in the HP and Dell um, architecture. So they're, based on what you're looking for, the price point for these is significantly lower than any data warehouse that you've probably uh, purchased or, or looked at in the past. So the value proposition that this data warehousing architecture provides is important. Um, one thing, it's appliance-like, and, and that's an aspect that's very important to understand is that you want to reduce the DBA effort in, in terms of identifying and resolving bottlenecks for every single component in your data warehouse. By putting a lot of knowledge and, and effort into this from the Microsoft perspective and our hardware partners, we have reduced this DBA effort and made it appliance-like. So you, in essence, purchase the hardware and software, and you don't really have to do much other than follow the guidelines, and you will have a very highly tuned architecture out of the box, ready to go, uh, ready for your infrastructure. 
choice of hardware platforms. Obviously, whatever platform you're used to, you can take advantage of. We've had customers that uh, wanted to validate their own fast track architecture with certain specific components that are their own. And with the guidance and, and availability of, of what we've provided, uh, you as a customer can also go down that route. Now, we do recommend, however, that you just purchase a system that's pre-architected, pre-designed, and you can take advantage of it uh, out of the gate, uh, re reducing any uh, overhead from your perspective. Uh, lowest TC uh, low TCO, not lowest, uh, through the industry standard hardware and obviously high scale. This, this architecture scales very, very well uh, up to about the 48 terabyte range, assuming a, a 2.5 compression ratio. Uh, which is standard and expected and, and most of the workloads we've run through. Uh, and finally, it's reducing of risk. Uh, we've validated this architecture, we've validated it with our hardware partners, and we've implemented best practices and provided them to you in very uh, very detailed documentation. So in summary, from the fast track, track perspective, um, it's a faster time to solution. If you really um, are in the process of identifying a, a data warehousing architecture, you could very quickly, in probably two to three months, have this system up and running, built, and even start the loading process uh, with very little overhead. In terms of time to market, that is a, a very different um, scale than what uh, a lot of the, the data warehousing projects have seen in the past. There's still work to be done in terms of data warehousing, in terms of identifying the schema, um, de defining and building the schema, conforming dimensions, doing all the stuff that any data warehousing project requires, but this takes the hardware and the software question out of it and makes it a very straightforward way. Also, um, there are additional benefits by taking advantage of the fast track that we'll go through in a few seconds in terms of our other component of the, of the data warehousing infrastructure. So in terms of the timeline, uh, in 2008, uh, we delivered SQL Server 2008, uh, including Enterprise ETL, Star Join Query Optimizations, a lot of data warehousing components that were, frankly, required for us to be able to deliver fast-track architecture. Then in 2009, we delivered our fast-track architecture version 1.0, partnering with HP, Dell, EMC, and Bull. Uh, in 2010, we delivered our fast-track data warehouse 2.0, and I would expect documentation um, for this architecture to uh, evolve uh, on a continuous basis. Uh, you can see at this, on this slide, if you do download the slide, I have included the documentation for the Fast Track 2.0 uh, link. It's msdnmicrosoft.com at this link. And then in 2010, we are delivering a test harness for partners in order to uh, create better um, validation of the Fast Track infrastructure. Um, so it's very easy for them to validate it and even give you documentation on the validation. And then finally, beyond uh, Fast Track V Next, the future. Uh, integrating more with partners and incorporating next versions of SQL Server. One of the benefits here is that through this analysis, we've found areas that we would like to improve in the relational engine SQL Server itself, and so there's a really good positive feedback uh, loop for the SQL Server product development team between uh, fast track architecture and uh, improvements in the product over time. So I'm going to take a step back and uh, kind of re-architect uh, what the data warehousing perspective is for Microsoft and then kind of go into the next area. The data warehousing perspective for Microsoft is really empowering every organization to be able to go uh, from the low end or the introductory level of a data warehouse all the way to the high end or the, the highest scale data warehouse uh, that you can imagine. And our goal is to focus on fast track for the introductory, the low end, the low cost, low TCO, um, a lot of our customers, probably a significant percentage uh, in the above 80%, are probably going to take advantage of the fast track as their first approach uh, because of its high scale, even with just a single symmetric multiprocessor. But there are always those situations where you want to have a, a larger implementation than even the 45 terabytes that we're talking about. And that's where Microsoft uh, SQL Server Parallel Data Warehouse comes in. SQL Server 2008 R2 Parallel Data Warehouse is a product that we're offering that's built on top of Windows Server 2008, leveraging, as we did with Fast Track, partner-based solutions for hardware. So we're getting a lot of the commoditization capabilities for these hardware architectures. But we're building out what we call a massively parallel um, processor environment for data warehousing technology. This is an appliance-like experience as well. 
Uh, it's much more appliance than what a fast track provides. It is purchasing of specific racks of this configuration. All hardware is purchased from a single vendor in one uh, or multiple units of racks. Um, you have multiple vendors to choose from, and it's orderable at the rack level. I can say I want a, a single rack, a parallel data warehouse, and then the vendor will assemble all the components. Uh, it will image the appliance, install the SQL server, the operating system, uh, the parallel data warehouse software, all that uh, imp installed and available for you so that what you do is you just turn it on at your site. The support uh, infrastructure is uh, defined through Microsoft, so Microsoft provides the first call support, and we have direct connections with our hardware vendors uh, to provide, you know, on-site break fix and other uh, services available. This may look familiar. This is the building block of a parallel data warehouse um, infrastructure. It is a database server and a storage node. This is also uh, the building block of the fast track architecture. When we decided to uh, architect the fast track implementation, we leveraged a lot of the learnings and knowledge that we had for the parallel data warehousing components and uh, implemented that in our fast track architecture. So this is a, a natural progression from the fast track con con conceptual model that we just discussed. Here's a layout of the full infrastructure of what a parallel data warehouse of plants uh, would look like. And I'll go through some of the highlighted components. You can see on the right-hand side, we have our storage uh, array or arrays. We have database servers that are um, connected to that storage infrastructure. These are connected with dual uh, fiber channel connections. Uh, we have control node, management node, landing zone, and backup node. And then on the left-hand side, you have your corporate infrastructure. Um, everything in the appliance in the database infrastructure is in a black box model um, located on its own network, its own internal network. So that, um, that isolates it from your corporate infrastructure. Uh, the way that your corporate infrastructure would leverage uh, querying would be through client drivers, ODBC, OLADB, connections directly into what we call our control node. So the control node is where the client apps connect. Uh, it is a massively parallel processing engine uh, control point, and this allows the, the system to be able to process queries up front and then span those queries across the back-end database servers that, that are in the appliance. It controls data movement to all the nodes uh, back and forth and contains all the system metadata. So this uh, control node is uh, really the interface between the outside world and the parallel data warehouse appliance. That control node, as you can see, is in a active-passive cluster, uh, so the control node is highly available. The compute nodes are the nodes that are database servers. Uh, they store the user data, they perform local query processing, and they run data movement services. And I'll talk a little bit more in depth about what that data movement service is all about. Uh, but just think of each compute node as its own isolated um, computing infrastructure with a standard SQL server installed, or with a regular SQL server installed, and it has its own local storage that it's taken advantage of. Uh, these servers, however, are not accessible to the outside world. Again, it's an appliance architecture, so each, even though there's a lot of SQL servers in, in this um, array, uh, they're not visible to the outside world. The outside world connects through the control node. Then there's a landing zone. This landing zone is a connection point between the outside world for being able to do ETL loads in and out. Uh, it's a staging place for uh, dumping the data into the appliance. Uh, it is accessible to the outside world, and it can be augmented by third-party hardware and software as well as, um, you know, other technologies. Then there's a backup node, and the backup node is available for uh, backing up your infrastructure. Uh, one implicit thing in this diagram is that the backup node has dedicated storage for itself and it can be of different configurations. And what that backup node does is it allows the system to have a consistent backup of the entire uh, data warehouse. In general, uh, we spec these out at about 30% of the total storage for the database server is uh, connected to the backup node for doing backups, uh, but that's something that's uh, configurable and choosable by the customer. And then finally, there's the management node. This is the Windows domain controller. Inside of this appliance is its own local lockdown domain uh, this uh, management node manages that domain. It uh, provides software upgrades and patching. Uh, this is what holds the software images in case the node needs uh, re-imaging. Uh, we use our 
Microsoft HPC or high performance computing infrastructure to uh, manage the entire appliance. So the appliance is, is auto managed through this um, infrastructure. The management server is available to, um, to connect from the outside world, but it's mainly just for its management user interface. Uh, one thing to note there too is that if you look at the client drivers, uh, this is really where you would uh, have a DBA connecting to. Uh, the management uh, node is generally from a monitoring perspective, some, somewhere for uh, systems monitoring and management. Uh, the ETL interface is where a DBA would be loading in data or a data steward uh, organization. And then finally, the corporate backup solutions would be uh, managed by that group. So we, we did look at this from a perspective in terms of the inter interconnections between the corporate infrastructure um, of a separation of duties uh, based on what generally a data warehousing uh, infrastructure would need. So important co functionality built into this is fault tolerance. All the hardware components have redundancy. The CPUs, the disks, uh, the networks, uh, power, storage, processors, uh, there's a lot of different capabilities uh, built into it. Uh, the control and the compute nodes use failover clustering, so those are available uh, continuously, even if there's a failure of the physical hard drive, or uh, physical uh, server. Um, and then the management nodes and the, um, they have active and standby uh, capabilities as well. So the management allows you to, to manage that infrastructure very uh, efficiently. This integrates very cleanly with the SQL Server BI tools, so integration services. We have a PDW uh, destination built in, in integration services, so you're able to directly load in and out uh, through integration services. Analysis services has a PDW source as well for building cubes, and uh, reporting services has connection and power pivot as well. There are other important functionality components like a parallel loader. Uh, this in that landing zone is a function that allows you to load your infrastructure in parallel with a very high performance loading process. Uh, there is a lot of uh, logic built into that so that the, the landing zone is not a single point of failure or a bottleneck for the infrastructure. Um, and if there's Q&A on that, I can go a little bit more in depth. Uh, there are two ways of implementing the parallel loader. There's an SSIS destination, as I described earlier, for those that like the, the visual interface. And then there is a command line tool that is built into the product as well. So you can do command line batch loading as well. Very performant, high-speed parallel copy is leveraged in order to do this, both uh, data loading and data exporting. Uh, this enables uh, the hub and spoke scenario that I'll describe a little bit later. But the, the real concept here is that uh, parallel copy is, um, is built into the system from day one from design and architecture. Um, there's also parallel backup and restore. Uh, the backup files are stored on backup nodes. As I said, it's a separate uh, disk, of set, uh, disk arrays. And backup files can be archived to external devices and systems. That's why we don't have 100% of the backup file uh, capacity on the system because you can put it uh, wherever you'd like in terms of tape or wherever else. This architecture is an ultra-shared nothing. Uh, it's an extension of traditional shared nothing designs. Uh, the pushes for shared nothing architecture in SMP nodes, um, and the I.O. and CPU affinity within the SMP nodes is leveraged for high performance. So that eliminates contentions per user query, and um, it allows us to use full uh, resources for each user query. Um, we made sure that by tuning the SQL servers on every given node, uh, we could take advantage of parallelization at each node, and also take advantage of the um, parallelization across the nodes in this infrastructure. And I'll talk about how that share, sharing model is uh, work. Now, this is, even though it's shared nothing, there is also, as I said before, a cluster built into the system so that any given node uh, can fail and that node's workload can be taken on by, through a, a failover um, process. There are multiple physical instances of tables. Um, we distribute large tables across the infrastructure, and we replicate small tables. So we'll talk a little bit about how that architecture works. Um, and that kind of adds to the ultra-shared nothing model to, to really improve performance. And finally, we redistribute rows uh, on the fly when necessary. Here's a layout of the software architecture of a parallel data warehouse. As you can see, the control node has a data access component, so it's connected to the outside world. 
Um, it also has an admin console. So this is where you would administer this infrastructure. The admin console is running uh, an IIS application and allows you to manage the entire uh, data warehouse appliance. Uh, the data access nodes um, provide OLADB, ODBC, ADO.NET, and JDBC connectivity um, to, frankly, almost any uh, data source or data destination that you'd like. Um, there are a couple components to the uh, engine for the um, analysis uh, for the parallel data warehouse. Uh, one is called the DMS, and that's the Data Movement Service. The Data Movement Service is a component that runs on almost every node of this infrastructure, and that allows us to synchronize data and to move data from each node to any other node, depending on the, uh, on the necessary means. Uh, the DMS also runs on this uh, control node, and allows you to, uh, to manage the, the queries as they're being sent backwards and forwards from the control node to the compute nodes, to the backup nodes, and the landing uh, zone nodes. Um, there's also a core engine uh, service uh, for the MPP engine coordinator. This allows uh, the system to manage what the core uh, queries are, uh, to parse out the queries and to send them uh, off to the different nodes. And then, as I said, there is a parser for SQL queries so that that engine can coordinate um, all the different nodes and being able to query across those multiple nodes. Uh, as you would expect, uh, there is a, an implementation of SQL Server on the control node, and that implementation of SQL Server um, stores the metadata, it stores authentication, configuration, schema, and, and attempt DB for this, uh, this control infrastructure. As you can see on the right-hand side, there's, uh, for each compute node, there's a data movement service as well, and a SQL Server database uh, that is uh, interconnected between that. And then the backup node and landing zone both have the data movement service uh, as well um, acting. So as I said, the MPP engine coordinator provides a single system image uh, to the outside world. So when you're connecting to this appliance, uh, you're not connecting to a bunch of SQL servers. You're connecting to a single SQL server from its perspective. In terms of the data movement service, uh, as I said, this data movement uh, service uh, applies data movement across the entire infrastructure. And, that, and that's one thing to note. For instance, if you load data from the, the landing zone, uh, that data may get moved to a given compute node, and then that given compute node will move it on to another compute node where its inevitable destination may be. Uh, that allows us to parallelize all the workload across all the nodes as we're doing work and not have a single uh, point bottleneck such as a landing zone might be if you uh, theoretically thought that the landing zone had to parse out where every single uh, record would end up. So here's a kind of a demonstration uh, our, that we've delivered. It's the TPC-DS uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's a 150 plus terabyte solution with one trillion rows for the store sales data. Uh, 100 million customer rows, um, and you can see the other dimensions that are uh, in this architecture. This is a, a sample architecture that we built out to kind of demonstrate how this would work. And you can see the database on the left-hand side, uh, and I'm going to talk through how the distribution uh, and replication would be delivered in this uh, warehouse architecture. So the first thing that you would do is you would deploy <clears throat> all of the infrastructure in two ways. First, you'd take the store sales table, which is the largest, the one trillion record table, and that would be a distributed table. So in other words, every node of that table is going to have or every node of the compute uh, nodes is going to have a piece of that table in the shared nothing model. Now, in terms of the replication, every one of those other database tables that are linked to that would actually be replicated. And that allows for a lot of optimization in terms of the localized queries. So localized queries in every compute node would be able to utilize localized data for all of the linked tables but then be able to provide queries on the, the major fact table localized and then consolidate that. Um, in terms of configuration and monitoring, uh, this is kind of a, a view of what the, the logging and performance counters are available for. Uh, we capture all the performance DMVs and we, under, we union uh, them uh, in the user interface. So from a DBA perspective, you'll be able to see what's happening under the covers throughout the entire infrastructure and this is available so that 
we can take advantage of uh, HPC monitoring. So this is a high-performance compute cluster uh, built inside of a single appliance, and uh, it takes advantage of all the benefits that you have for configuration and monitoring of that. In terms of the parallel data warehouse timeline, uh, we acquired a technology company uh, called Data Allegro uh, in 2008, which took advantage of this same technology for the parallel data warehouse uh, and had built it out uh, in, in form and even delivered it to some customers. So what we did is we acquired that, that company, uh, acquired the technology, acquired the, uh, the intellectual property and the resources from that organization. Uh, and then we brought that into uh, Microsoft and delivered uh, a project called Project Madison, uh, which took the Data Allegro product line and put it uh, into a Microsoft um, process in order to validate security, in order to integrate uh, Microsoft technologies, and also to in integrate SQL Server into the product as, uh, as the core component and as the, the SQL interface. Uh, and then in 2010, uh, delivery of SQL Server 2008 R2 Parallel Data Warehouse, uh, MTP, that's the Madison Technology Preview Program, that allowed us to bring in customers and have them leverage the infrastructure and build it out and validate it. And now we're at the point where uh, SQL Server 2008 R2 Parallel Data Warehouse uh, MTP2 is uh, in process, and we are expecting a release to manufacture in 2010, summer. So after that, uh, we expect a PDW uh, version next um, to follow on with some SQL Server uh, improvements that we're going to be delivering in the next release of SQL Server. So taking advantage of a lot of the improvements uh, that we've done so far from Data Allegro into Project Madison, uh, it is now a, uh, an integrated part of the SQL Server stack, so we should expect every generation of SQL Server to have improvements to the parallel data warehouse as we would to the, to the standard relational engine, uh, similar to what happens to the other engines. So the next uh, five minutes, I'm actually going to describe why this is important and, and how this all fits together. And it really comes down to the concept of a hub and spoke architecture. If you think about the standard uh, enterprise data warehousing uh, technology and, and uh, scope that we've seen to date, uh, EDL, EDWs uh, provide a single version of the truth, uh, but generally it makes it difficult to support mixed workloads and multiple user groups uh, requiring different service level agreements. Uh, it's a centralization point. It's often uh, difficult to, uh, to take advantage of by, by multiple end users. Uh, and so what we found in general is departments will create their own data marts. And that enabled uh, mixed workloads. It kind of took the, the big EDW out of the picture. But that is difficult to consolidate information across the enterprise. So it's kind of a, a double-edged sword when you start taking this data away from the central hub. So our conceptual model then here is a hub and spoke model, where the hub is your EDW, your centralized store, but we have spokes that have solutions that can deliver to each user group uh, that would have differing levels of service level agreement and, uh, and requirements. So what we recommend is you create SQL Server 2008, fast track data warehouses, analysis services, uh, or other third party type spokes that could take advantage of uh, subsets of the data that's in your enterprise data warehouse uh, but the centralized hub would be uh, your EDW. So in terms of that, obviously our recommendation is that the PDW, the Parallel Data Warehouse, would be that centralized hub. Uh, and by using that, um, PDW has defined in it and built in uh, a concept of a parallel database copy. So the ability to take massive amounts of data from the hub and forward, uh, push that data directly into any spoke that is attached to that hub through the technology. So it's very fast, very performant, and, uh, and is designed for this. Uh, it's designed for this data movement process to make sure that we have consistent data between the hub and spokes uh, that is available consistently to the end users. Um, therefore, you can prov uh, provide support for a lot of different user groups with different SLAs. Some user groups are going to have very high performance query SLAs uh, that could not even be delivered out of maybe a PDW, but you can isolate it on a single fast track for that subset of group of users and guarantee performance. And again, this kind of comes back to the first concept I was talking about, where people want consistency as well as performance. They want to have consistent results. So this is a way by the hub and spoke to be able to build a consistency layer for certain groups that really want that consistency 
um, for their specific workload. It allows you to also scale out capacity, uh, deliver uh, loading performance uh, capabilities that you can load a, a hub, for instance, uh, load a spoke and then load it up into the hub, uh, and a lot of the other capabilities. This also provides for an expansion of your concurrency so multiple users can utilize your warehouse without actually putting load on your, uh, your main EDW. Here's a, a layout of kind of a, a sample uh, approach. You can see that we have the parallel data warehouse in the center as the central EDW hub, and we have high-performance uh, reporting being delivered off of a standard SQL Server 2008 R2 box on the right-hand side uh, using SSIS to pull data. Uh, you can also see that we have a fast track system both at the top and on the left, and that double arrow that you see is that parallel database copy component that EDW provides in the parallel data warehouse. So the parallel data warehouse technology, fast uh, copying databases directly into fast track architecture uh, built into the product. So that's, that's a part of the process. And then, of course, each one of those fast track systems can provide mobile apps, BI, uh, Office 2010 components, um, pulling data from that. And you can see, obviously, at the bottom, we've got landing zone uh, pulling data from any data source and even sending that data out to third-party uh, locations that you'd like as well. So very clean infrastructure in terms of the hub-and-spoke model. So now you're asking yourself, well, why, what do I choose when? And this is a, an age-old question, frankly. Uh, what we see here is this is a, kind of like a layout of, um, of a decision matrix. And if you look at the left-hand side, there's an arrow that's going up. And the up arrow really talks about scale, complexity, HA requirements by default, uh, software and hardware integration. So each one of those components is at its highest point at the top of this graph. And each one of those components is at a probably a little bit lower point as you move down this graph. So if you see... SQL Server 2008 at the bottom, that really spans the entire uh, fabric of what you can provide in terms of a data warehousing workload for scale, complexity, HA capabilities by default, and software and hardware integration. Uh, you can see that this actually spans up uh, a little bit high as we swoop up the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, SQL Server 2008 fast track architecture is really uh, a step above that for a specific workload. And that's why we kind of keep it on the same layers. It's a higher scale, uh, it provide, it's a little bit higher complexity, it provides better HA by default, and software hardware integration. Um, then we move up to the higher level, which is the PDW, and the PDW provides a, a significantly better scale, significantly better complex, uh, more complexity, uh, a high a HA by default, and then obviously the integration for software and hardware is significantly better. In the fast track, uh, you're in essence acquiring the hardware from a vendor and uh, following our practices for installing SQL Server in the PDW, it's all pre-installed as, uh, as it arrives. And then finally, item number four is a PDW hub and spoke model where it takes advantage of all those different components. This is also a linear timeline, what we would expect most customers. Most customers are going to either have a, a SQL Server or some other database architecture for their warehouse. They're going to probably move that into a fast track architecture for the low TCO, and then as requirements demand, move that into a PDW or a PDW hub and spoke model based on uh, what their expansion needs are. So finally, in summary, uh, the Fast Track delivers an appliance-like feature set with a very, very low cost on commodity hardware. I apologize for the typo there. Uh, Parallel Data Warehouse offers massive scalability to the hundreds of terabytes of level. Um, its appliance experience is far superior to what you would get with Fast Track because it really is an appliance. Uh, we do, however, give you hardware choice for all the different components, uh, and it's a low cost uh, through industry standard hardware. So this is, again, following the Microsoft traditional way and complete integration with the Microsoft BI tools. Um, with the hub and spoke architecture, this allows you to integrate your current SMP infrastructure, buy or build a Fast Track architecture, expand that to a parallel data warehouse um, hub and spoke model, and never really lose the capabilities or have to replace uh, forklift upgrade or anything like that, your infrastructure. So having said that, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Phil for any questions and answers and uh, ask for you to, uh, to stay on the line and, and I'll answer any questions I can. Thank you. All right. Thanks, David. And ladies and gentlemen, if you do have any questions for David, 
Please go ahead and click on your Q&A menu option at the top of your screen, type your question into the field provided, and then click the word ask. Uh, be sure to click the word ask and not the hand. The hand will not submit your question, so uh, be sure to do that. If you would like to print a PDF of the slides, you may go to the lower right-hand corner of your client and click on the PDF, or the printer option, rather, and that will allow you to save or print a PDF locally for your convenience. And finally, appearing uh, in your slide area here in just a moment, is the portal to the post-event evaluation. Please click on either of the links that are currently posted on your slide area, either registered online or all other registrants, depending on how you registered for today's webcast. And uh, if you would fill that out before logging off today, it would be very much appreciated. It uh, is taken very seriously, and we do uh, take that into consideration when um, setting up future TechNet webcast and their content. Uh, with that, I am going to turn the floor back over to David for any questions that have been submitted or any closing statements. Um, okay, so this is David again. And first of all, I just uh, realized that this was set to level 300, and I want to apologize because um, I couldn't go into technical detail since there was so much topic to cover. Uh, on each of the different components. I will recommend, though, um, if you are looking for in more in-depth uh, knowledge about it, the architecture is completely defined in our white paper for the Fast Track architecture, and it's version 2.0, uh, and that, that link is in the, uh, the slide deck, so please, please look into that. <clears throat> so let's look at some of these uh, questions. Um, it looks like they're all Q&As for the... Bridge line, dial information. All the questions I have say there's audio problems. Can you help me, Phil, see if there's any questions that are for the product? Uh, currently, there are no questions that are uh, content-based. Um, those were for dial-in questions. Uh, looks like one just came in, though. Okay. Okay. So when working with PDW, how different uh, is it than working with relational SQL Server in terms of SQL Query SSIS? Great question. Uh, we support a subset of the standard uh, T-SQL uh, that is available with standard SQL Server. However, from your perspective as uh, a query tool, um, it looks just like a SQL Server. Uh, there are certain data types that we do not support in PDW that um, is on the uh, options for the future, but it from a perspective of a client, uh, if you're currently running a data warehouse and it's, it's on SQL Server and you want to upgrade it to PDW, uh, the workload uh, queries that your clients are using, all they would just do is use the PDW source instead of uh, a standard SQL Server source, and uh, to them there would be no difference. All, all of your database tables would look the same, the queries would be the same. Uh, the same. In terms of SSIS, <clears throat> the, the PDW destination obviously is a, and source is a different destination than uh, than the SQL Server destination, but it would act uh, in a similar way. So it's designed to to load that data uh, through SSIS. Any other questions? And once again, ladies and gentlemen, if you do have any other questions, please type them into the field uh, provided once you click on your Q&A menu option and then click the word ask. Okay, it does not appear that there are any other questions pending in the queue. Um, David, do you have any closing statements? Oh, there, uh, as I mentioned it, there's a question. All right. So uh, do we still get tools like Profiler in PDW? Thanks. Okay, uh, that's a good question. And the answer is yes and no, um, as usual. The PDW has that interface that I was talking about before that allows you to monitor what's happening in the system. Uh, and that's, uh, that does provide similar capabilities to what Profiler provides because it gives you uh, visibility into the DMVs and what's happening on the box. Um, so in general, we don't have a Profiler that's 
for every single SQL server running on every single individual node. We have a higher level profiler that is for the PDW environment itself, which has similar capabilities to what you get in profiler, uh, but it's not profiler. Now, having said that, um, this is a SQL Server infrastructure, and every single node is running a, a regular version of SQL Server, and therefore provides uh, visibility. So, if, if you're having a, um, a need for visibility down to the level of detail that is not available at the highest level, uh, for instance, if there's a customer support um, problem with our support organization, uh, they have visibility that can get uh, as, as minute of detail as, as required to find out what's happening inside of a specific given box. I have a question. Was this on par with what people were looking for? Um, I, I want to make sure that we're at Microsoft delivering what everybody's looking for. So uh, um, please give feedback on, on the process as, as necessary. Any other questions to answer? And we currently do not have any other questions pending in the queue. Well then, it's uh, been 90 minutes. I appreciate everybody for their time and um, appreciate uh, the opportunity to explain uh, one of our very important flagship components of our data warehousing stack to you. All right, thank you, David. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, once again, if you would please take a moment to fill out the post-event evaluation, the portal of which is currently posted on your slide area. You can go ahead and click on either of those links. Uh, they will both take you there. And it looks like one other question has popped up into the queue, David, if you do want to take that. Oh, that is just a thanks. And uh, with that, uh, I would like to formally thank Mr. David Rodriguez for his uh, time and his presentation. Thank you all for joining us. You may now disconnect from the audio portion of today's webcast, and have a great day.